that. So um, I think we've given everybody a chance to find us on Facebook. So we'll start the show. I was telling Mark in the green room, um, the last time that we hosted him was with his daughter um, back at probably what, maybe 10 years ago, Mark? Years ago, yeah, she was 10, she's 20 now. <laughs> yeah, and so that was so much fun. And we were, we were kind of uh, reminiscing that it would have been so wonderful to be in the, um, in the store for, again, for an event. But Maybe next year, next book, next book that maybe you'll talk talk to us about in a little bit. So um, just real quick, I'm going to do a quick intro of the gentleman, and then we'll pass it off to them to start their conversation. So Mark Kurlansky is a New York Times bestselling author of Havana, Cod, Salt, Paper, and my personal favorite, because I'm Basque, the Basque history of the world. <laughs> I gave that to everybody in my family has read that book. <laughs> Where is, your, where is your family from? Uh, Garnica is my oh. grandfather, and Sestau is my grandmother, um, oh. is where she's from. And my daughter just went back to visit um, last year for the first time. Uh, the, the, I was back there back in the 70s, but haven't been back since. But um, yeah, full, full my mother's full-blooded. Ituri is her last name. So you're a Vizcaino. Yep. Um, okay, back to the books. <laughs> we digressed a little bit. <laughs> 1968, The Big Oyster and Milk, among other titles. He has received the Dayton Literary Prize, Peace Prize, Bon Appetit's Food Writer of the Year Award, the James Beard Award, and the Glenn Fittich Award. His articles have appeared in a wide variety of newspapers and magazines, including the Chicago Tribune, the Los Angeles Times, Time Magazine, Harper's, Audubon Magazine, Food and Wine, Gourmet Bon Appetit, and Parade. He lives in New York City, and he will be talking to us tonight about his latest book, Salmon, a fish, the earth, and the history of their common fate. Joining Mark tonight is our very own Neil Centuria. He is CEO of Blackbird Ventures, and I say our own, meaning San Diegan. <laughs> um, and Black, uh, Blackbird Ventures is a small venture fund that is focused on very early stage companies. He is a motivational speaker and also volunteers as a business teacher at Donovan State Prison, where he helps implement entrepreneurship, employment, and leadership training programs that serve people with criminal histories. Neil has also taught entrepreneurship at San Diego State University in the MBA program, as well as at UC San Diego's Von Liebig School of Entrepreneurism in the Division of Engineering. He's the author of three books and writes a weekly column on entrepreneurship for the San Diego Union Tribune. And with that, Neil and Mark, have a wonderful conversation. We'll see you in about 40 minutes. Okay, okay you're most kind. So um, Mark's book is Salmon. And I'm assuming that most of the people who have logged on know that salmon return to their home. That's where they spawn. So I had this nightmare after I read the book, which is, so the salmon comes in from the ocean. He goes up the river and he jumps through a bunch of dams and whatever. He finally gets his when He finds some developer has acquired his red and has built a high rise and there's no place for him. This was a nightmare, which brings me to one of the sentences which will allow Mark to, uh, to expound. He says, page 32, all that is true, but a more, important po a more important point is that if the salmon does not survive, there is little hope for the survival of the planet. And with that, Dr. Kurlansky, have at it. Yeah, well, I, um, I, did, I did this book specifically because it does illustrate that point. I mean, I, in 1997, I did a book on cod. And this was at about the time that the uh, northern cod stocks were collapsing on the Grand Banks. And it was um, this big shocking thing that got people really talking a lot about overfishing. And... Um, They've continued to talk about overfishing. And I have continued to follow cod and many other fisheries. And it's become very clear to me that overfishing is just one of many problems, um, not even the leading problem. But if you actually had a fishery where the only problem was overfishing, that would be wonderful. That would be so solvable compared to what we have. Um, uh, so many problems uh, and you know this is why I say in the case of salmon 
you know, these are the problems of the earth. We fix it or we don't have a planet. Um, when you asked, the, when we spoke earlier, I asked you what is exceptional about the salmon? And with full disclosure, I'm a fly fisherman for 40 years and have caught more than my fair share, lots of trout, but in fact, a fair number of salmon. So I'll tell you they're exceptional because they're uh, large and they fight, etc. But tell us why they're exceptional. Well, yeah, they, they really are. Um, I mean, trout are pretty exceptional also, but salmon are really something else in, in nature. Uh, one, one of the most uh, astonishing animals in the, in the, in the whole uh, natural world. Um, born in freshwater rivers, uh, grow to a certain size, completely change their, their body, both their outer body and their physiology to become an ocean fish, go out to sea for years, um, travel thousands of miles from that river. And then at a certain point realize, I mean, they just know it is time to reproduce and they go back to that river. And it's not entirely known how they find that river. Um, uh, they oh, do wait, don't they have don't they have Google Maps? Uh, well, they invented Google, but that's another story. <laughs> um, they um, they have a very keen sense of smell, which explains how they get because once they get into the river, they have to find the exact spot of their birth, and they can do that by smell. But how do they find the river? We don't exactly know. We think that there is some sort of uh, um, stellar navigation, they, they have some uh, magnetic uh, materials along their lateral stripe and they, they may be using that for navigation. Um, <clears throat> somehow they get back to this exact river and they completely change again. And <clears throat> here's one of the extraordinary things which you know because you're a fly fisherman, I'm also a fly fisherman, once they go in the river, they no longer eat anything, um, which leaves the whole question of why do they eat flies, but <laughs> that's another thing. They, they, um, if they did eat, they would wipe out the river because they've become such ferocious eaters, voracious eaters in the ocean. Uh, they would just eat everything in the river, uh, but this is how nature deals with it. They have just enough energy, enough fat and protein stored up to make it back to that spot where they were born and spawn. Um, they completely change themselves physically, which also takes a lot of energy. You know, they become red, depends on the species. Sockeye become bright red. They all become a little reddish and they do this by pumping all of the pigment out from their flesh, which I mean, you can just imagine how much energy that uses up. When after a salmon has spawned, its flesh is white because all its pigment has gone out on its skin. And a after they've spawned, they're going to die. Um, yes, uh, Pacific salmon, definitely. Atlantic salmon, probably. They just have nothing left. So uh, I, I know that you're astute and have written many books. I really enjoyed, I actually read this thing. I mean, normally, you know, if, if, if you're Bill Maher, you didn't really read the book, but I actually read the book and I want to call attention to the concept of when the salmon goes back to the red, finds his place, her place, her place, and deposits her eggs. It says when a female's depositing eggs, she makes certain contorted mouth movements. This is to point out that Dr. Karlansky actually has a sense of humor. Listen to this. Sometimes she'll make these mouth movements before depositing eggs to trick an attractive male into coming onto the red. Anthropomorphizers like to call this the salmon equivalent of faking an orgasm. Kolansky, you're my kind of guy. <laughs> uh, I didn't make that up. That's in the no, book. No, it's it, and it's 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 true. I mean, it, it, it's the whole mating ritual of the salmon is incredibly complicated, and um, trying to get you know the right guys for your eggs, and uh, uh, that's what this whole thing about the metamorphosis. You know, they they they. they become very strange looking, bright colored, and they get humps on their back and their, their mouth gets misshapen and they get hooked noses. And um, you know, Darwin was very troubled by this. 
that why why did they do this? Darwin believed correctly that everything that's done in nature has a reason. So why would they be doing this? He also wondered why do certain uh, beetles have horns that they never use for anything? Males. And so Darwin wondered, did he get an answer? Yes. Yeah. It's it's sex. It's uh, trying yeah, to the attract underlying theme of America of, of the world, right? That you kind of it's trying to attract females. You know, uh -huh. that, that weird looking sockeye salmon is like the guy who shows up in this awful plaid suit. And he <laughs> says, why, why are you dressed like that? And he says, well, you know, the girls really like it, but they do. <laughs> so one of the things we talked about when we discussed earlier is, since I'm, I'm, I'm assuming you're reasonably satisfied that, or since Biden's the, met, might be the president, you talked a lot about climate change. And so what's the correlation climate change and salmons and what are your thoughts on that? That was an area you had some strong feelings. Yeah, I mean, uh, the biggest problem facing salmon is climate change. And if you look at what climate change is doing to salmon, you realize what a cataclysmic problem this is. I mean, it's not only the warming of temperatures because salmon cannot live or reproduce in water that's over 68 degrees. So they have these recent summers in Seattle, they've had great salmon runs, but they haven't been reproducing like they should because the water's been too warm. They've been having oddly warm summers in, in, in Alaska. Um, but beyond that, carbon emissions, carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide loves water, about a third of the carbon emissions go into the ocean and they change the chemistry of the ocean. And now uh, certain things won't grow like they used to, like capelin and zooplankton. And th these are the things that large fish like uh, salmon and also cod and halibut that they, they live off of. Um, and so you have this phenomenon more in the Atlantic than the, than the Pacific where um, you know, I went around and I talked to river managers in Canada and Scotland and Ireland and Norway and all these places and they kept saying, you know, we've got uh, good spawning, we got a lot of fish going to sea, and they're just not coming back at the rates they used to. The reason they're not coming they're back, back in the ocean and they don't come back? They don't come back. The reason is that there isn't enough for them to eat in the ocean. The ocean is losing its carrying capacity. It's losing its ability to feed the animals that live there. So if they don't bulk up enough, they don't have enough energy to get back to the red. Right. In, in something like 40 years of writing about environmental issues, this is the scariest thing I ever learned. I mean, listen, folks, if, uh, if the oceans can no longer feed the animals that live there, we're sunk. Um, hmm. So. Wow, I, I, I am, uh, uh, for whatever reason, used to be a professional photographer. I collect photographic books and I have one. I'm actually, I can't, can't see it. It's called The Place No One Knew. Of course, that's one of the famous dams. It's photographed by Elliot Porter. So you write a little bit about dams. Uh, I don't understand how they jump over a dam. Is there, a, can you explain that? Well, the short I answer- On the Olympic, uh, you know, uh, gymnastic team. Uh, the short answer is they don't. They uh, don't. That's the problem. Sometimes they do, but you know, uh, salmon are incredible animals. They they can jump eleven feet in the air, which um, you know is a, you you look at a salmon and you you think how you know it doesn't have any legs to push off. How does it do that? You, there are places where you can see them do it just fly into the air, but. Um, there are dams. There's a lot of dams that are more than eleven feet high. Uh, that they can't make it over. Um, fish ladders have a mixed success rate. Sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. When they work, they don't work as well as you would hope they would. Um, so dams uh, are, are another huge problem. What steps are the, is the country taking to either increase or preserve the existing salmon stock? When I think about that, let's call it North America. Well, th there are things that there, there are actually some dams that are being taken down. 
and there have been some efforts to rebuild rivers because you know the destruction of the habitat is also a huge problem the uh, deforestation of banks the lack of trees in the water you know, they're building stuff to replace that they, things are, are are being done um but look this is what i learned <laughs> doing this book uh because I, I i started doing the whole history of salmon going back you know to the romans and before that to prehistoric man actually um and you know, you start seeing certain patterns of people understand that netting in rivers isn't good. There were a lot of, you know, in the Middle Ages, there were laws against netting in rivers. The Magna Carta restricts the King of England from, from netting in rivers to protect salmon. So they were, you know, they, they were always aware of these problems. Um, but when the Industrial Revolution came about, they started, um, building dams to power mills and these mills dump pollution into the water and uh, Britain basically killed all its rivers. And then in New England, um, people, people mostly of British origin um, did the exact same thing in New England, you know, built mills, built dams to power them, polluted the rivers, killed all the rivers in New England. Then they started thinking about how to develop the Pacific Northwest. And this was also very often people from New England who came up with this idea, we'll build these huge hydroelectric dams, we'll have you know, lots of energy and we can build the economy on that. The Pacific Northwest produces more energy than any place in the world and has built a huge economy on that. Um, also killed all its rivers like the Columbia, which was, you know, the greatest river in North America. And so I started thinking, how come they never learn from their mistakes? And that's when I realized it's because they don't think it's a mistake. <laughs> the, the, the British uh, set out to become the great industrial power of the Industrial Revolution and succeeded. New England became the greatest industrial center of North America. Uh, the Pacific Northwest developed this huge economy. Uh, to a certain set of people, these are great success stories. So, you know, the, the argument is, you know, you wanna protect the environment or do you wanna create jobs? I mean, Republicans are great at putting this argument out all the time. It's a false argument. You have to figure out ways to develop the economy that don't destroy the earth. You can do this. You, just have, to, you have to rethink it. Look, look, you know, what does it tell us that in times of economic decline, like right now, uh, the uh, environment improves, carbon emissions are down. So <laughs> nobody's it, driving anywhere. Right, it's the development of the economy, the success of the economy that is destroying us. We have to figure out a different way of doing things. You know, we're great technological thinkers. We come up with all kinds of technology. We can come up with technology that isn't destructive. Well, let's try this one. Uh, you and I batted the ball around on Tesla and what I'll call electric cars. What are your thoughts there? Um, you know, you kind of you kind of caught me off balance on this because I, I got to tell you, uh, I'm a New Yorker. I don't have a car, and I don't know a whole lot about them. <laughs> and I, well, you I, made it, you made I say in my book, I say in my book that a salmon can accelerate faster than an automobile. I have no idea how fast an automobile <laughs> accelerates. This is something that I have been told in science. So I don't know a lot about cars, but this is what I do know. They, if, if we are going to use cars, they have to be cars that um, do not put a lot of carbon in, in, in the atmosphere. Now, um, if you want to have this debate about Tesla or electric cars and building the batteries, is that, you know, I have no idea, <laughs> really, to be honest with you. But I think that either Either of these cars reduce carbon emissions or we shouldn't be doing them. We should be moving on to something else. Let me ask you about eating. 
So it, it you, cause you won some awards for uh, Bon Appetit, et cetera. Um, do we eat a lot of salmon? Not yeah. enough salmon or should we eat more salmon? I know a lot more about eating than I do about cars. It's true. Good, but we're going to switch to uh, Bon Appetit and, uh, and, uh, um, uh yeah. People ask people ask me this all the time. You know, should I should I eat salmon? Should I uh, should I eat wild salmon? Um, yeah, eat wild salmon. Uh, there are a, a, a number of places that are well regulated fisheries, uh, mainly in the case of the U.S. West Coast, uh, Alaska. Um, and this this stuff is it's it's well done, and this is a good food to eat. Um, are we overeating? No, you can't. Oh, I mean, we're, we're not well, running out of fish to eat. You know, the, the whole idea, you, can't, you cannot overeat a sustainable fishery. The whole point of it, I, I, kids ask me this all the time. So they say, if you don't eat anything but sustainable fish, aren't we going to run out of them? No, the whole point of sustainable means that you don't run out. Um, you, you're harvesting them in a way that the supply is, is, is maintained. But wait, 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 that's a little bit of a trick, which is what if we increase our salmon consumption? Aren't we going to deplete the stock? No. No. Because the, because the salmon, I mean, there are places that are badly managed, not very few. Most of them have been shut down. Most of the salmon fisheries are well managed and uh, what that means is that they won't catch more fish than the the fishery can, can provide so ah. worst the worst you could do is eat all the fish that they catch uh, which would not wipe out the fishery because they only catch the amount that you can uh, that you can harvest without damaging the total stock what would you like to have happen? if you could pull strings for this thing called a salmon in America. You, you, it's 400, how many pages is it? It's uh, 370 pages and I was actually mesmerized. I mean, you know more about salmon than the salmon do. What would you like, what is your, if you, if you could be the salmon czar? Um, well, you have to do a lot of things. Well, you know. You, you know, you have to. Yeah. You, 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 you have to deal with climate change. If you don't solve climate change, um, then they're sunk and we're sunk. And this is why I say, you know, that the saving salmon is completely tied in with saving the earth. You have to solve that problem, you know? What it, are the two or three things in the priority? Uh, I accept that you want okay, to solve, that's top. but, but that's, I want to- that, I want That's to really top. Good. Now, when you get into the priority, that's top everywhere. But then the priority changes in different places. Uh, in the Pacific Northwest, I would say number two would be dams. Uh, you got to open up dams. Um, you also have to reforest banks. Uh, you have to change uh, agricultural uh, practices because some of them are very damaging. Uh, Rice farming in Japan is very damaging to uh, the salmon runs in northern Japan. Um, you know, it, so it depends where you are. I mean, farming practices would be a very high priority in Japan, for example. Um, uh, you you have to um, you have to take on these problems place by place, and and. and uh, you can't be simple-minded about it. Some places it's some things, and some places it's another thing. But I don't know of any place where it's just one thing. What do you, if if you wanted somebody to take away the best the best story in the book, there's many. What would be the best story you'd like to tell us? The best story. Let me just make this go away. Um, well, you know, my favorite story is the one I just did about how the, the, the whole concept of um, uh, economic development has, has been wrong. Uh, but uh, I mean, the, 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 um, 
the salmon it, it, itself is, is uh it's an incredible story, you know, that, that it, it's like written by a Greek tragedian. And, uh, uh, you know, the way these animals give everything they have to reproduce and die. Uh, there's no future in being a salmon, you know. Uh, I will tell you that, that we did also talk about, I'm a big fan of, <clears throat> so tell me why Copper River salmon cost me $30 a pound and salmon salmon cost me $19 a pound. Uh, the short answer is because the people running Copper River salmon are really smart. Yeah, I, I love the idea that a salmon's a salmon, except if it's a Copper River salmon, it costs you more because it's branded well, it's Copper not, River salmon. It's not entirely that. There are certain things like it, it, it's the first salmon in Alaska to come in. So it's the first salmon of the year. That gives it a cachet. Also, the longer and more difficult a river is, um, the better specimens the salmon are. And the Copper River is a, is a pretty tough river. Um, the rivers off of Bristol Bay, most of them are not nearly as long or as tough. So those, those salmon don't have the quality of the Copper River salmon. But, you know, frankly, the most important thing is that they understand marketing. They, they, you know, branded at Copper River. And listen, I, I spend a lot of time in Gloucester, Massachusetts, which is the oldest fishing port in America. And they're struggling and the there. Deadly, the deadly catch. And, you know, I've never seen it, but um, uh, I, I don't have the heart to watch it, I think. But, um, you know, they're struggling there. And I tell the guys, you know, go to Cordova, Alaska and check out Copper River Salmon, how they do things. And that's how you should be selling your cod. Cod. You, you, you um, fish for it well, you take good care of it, you take it to market in excellent shape and you brand it. You know, Gloucester cod could mean something just like Copper River Salmon. Uh, you, you have to, sell these fish as a thing of value. Now, there's a double-edged sword here that I don't have a solution for. One of the solutions to fisheries is to do all this, and then you get a better price for your fish. If you get a better price for your fish, you can prosper without catching too many fish. That is an ideal formula. But what are poor people supposed to eat? That is why I would not be too quick to say no to farmed salmon because it provides an affordable fish. So on the, on the coast of California and Mexico, there are a large number of hatcheries in the ocean. Mm -hmm. uh, tuna, um, I mean, lots of fishes. Mm -hmm. um, how are you on the sustainability of using little fish and then the pen and then they grow and then you let them go and okay so so as not to get confused about this hatchery and farming are two separate issues so i had mentioned farming and you're going to hatchery so this is this is a different issue but wait i i when i talk about pens in the ocean i think that's hatchery fish right or is that farming the way you, you what is the difference Far farming is where you uh, reproduce fish and set them off in the wild to increase the, the wild stocks. Farm but, fish. But you raise them in a pen. If you raise them in a pen to, to bring to, to market, that's farming. But hatcheries don't raise them to bring to market. They raise them to be big enough to be released into the wild. And when you release them into the wild, how does it, well, how, what's the economics of a hatchery? I understand farming. What's the economics of a hatchery? Well, it depends. Originally, in the 19th century, um, in California, the McLeod River, uh, places like that, the economics was to sell the, uh, sell the eggs and make a lot of money. 
you know, sell the eggs back to the East Coast, sell them to Europe, sell them to Australia. But then in time, they realized that this doesn't work, that the fish that you create will only flourish in that spot. Uh, the fish are very, especially salmon, are very particular to, to a, a spot. I mean, you have salmon, uh, if, you, if you have two salmon that are the same species in two different rivers that are next to each other, their DNA is completely different. They, they won't go up the wrong river. They're not confused. No, um, occasionally, occasionally <laughs> they do. They don't go up the wrong river. Occasionally, they'll go up a river that doesn't have salmon, which is called strain. And that is an important thing because that's, that, that is one of the ways in which salmon keep going, you know, explore new rivers. Uh, um, the, right now, there's salmon going into rivers in the north slope of Alaska that used to be too frozen for salmon. Um, but this is why, you know, if you have a river that's been killed off by dams and you tear down the dams and you reopen it, you want to bring back a river like the Awa in Washington or the Penobscot in uh, Maine, um, salmon will come into it. Um, because some salmon do that. Um, but by and large, uh, salmon will not do well in rivers other than their native river. And so for hatcheries to work, you have to have a hatchery for a specific river. So then how are they, how are they making money? Getting back to your, your question there. Um, by and large, they're not. By and large, these are funded projects. The, the, so, the, idea um, of, the idea of hatcheries as a big commercial thing, salmon hatcheries as a commercial thing, has, has pretty much been a failure. Um, yeah, I haven't been asked to invest in one yet, so I'm, I appreciate you giving me guidance. <clears throat> but you have, uh, you, you have some history as a, as a chef. Uh, you, you, you've got some recipes. So tell me about smoked salmon, or how should I cook my salmon? Uh, blackened salmon. G give me a salmon-esque uh, view of what I can have for dinner tonight. Well, you know, of course, the problem with food is that you get to personal prejudices. And You're entitled to those. I, 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 I think the best salmon is, is a wild salmon grilled. Okay. Maybe, <laughs> a, little, maybe a little salt. A little salt. I'm going to grill it. Um, and what about grav lox? You know, short Jewish people are used to those things. Like, uh, well, like Zay bars. <laughs> I live around the corner from Zay bars. Um, the, you, have to, you have to explain to our audience, who may not be New York Jewish uh, delicatessen uh, uh, carnivores, what a grav lox is. Well, grav lox was not originally Jewish. Grav lox was Scandinavian. What it means is just what it sounds like. Uh, it's buried salmon. That's what it means literally. And burying, burying fish by the shoreline is a very ancient way of preserving fish. Um, and, um, you know, Iceland, the national dish of Iceland is a Greenland shark that's been buried. Uh, it's called Hakarl. Um, hopefully there aren't any Icelanders listening because I got to tell you, it's the worst thing I've ever tasted in my life. <laughs> and I've had it many times because every time I go to Iceland, they say, oh, you have to have some Hakarl. And I say, sure, I will. Fortunately, they have very strong alcohol that you can drink with it. Um, but of course, uh, smoking uh, is, is a way of preserving. Do you uh, like smoked salmon? Do I like smoked salmon? Sure. Because uh, I recently, recently, a couple, I've been in Alaska a few times and they catch, I'm not particularly interested, but they catch king salmon. And they do it by, you know, backfilling the boat and kind of, and you're only allowed two. And then you give the salmon to the cannery and they smoke it and put it in a can and then you get to take it home. That's your, that's how the Alaskan king salmon racket for travel and for fishing is done. Um, well, you hang out with the wrong people, you know, because you go to the right place and they'll freeze it fresh and ship it to you. Yeah. 
<clears throat> well, shows you what I know. Uh, you know, you go, go through this whole thing to catch this beautiful fish, and what do you end up with a can of fish? This doesn't sound right to me. <laughs> but uh, I'll, I'll tell you that I've, I've fished commercially in, in Alaska, not uh, for a living, but just for the experience when I was researching this book. And it's really extraordinary how hard you work and how little money you get. Now that it's, seems to be America today. It's very good. Doesn't have to go to Alaska. You can stay on well, the lower it is, 48. It is America, but but it, it also is fisheries everywhere. I mean, the fishermen get such a small part of what yeah. you make. When you the, uh, that's a whole issue. If you're in a software business like I am, <laughs> then you begin to understand an e-commerce, you understand supply chain. So the irony, of course, is the salmon at Gelson's is X dollars a pound. And then you work backwards. It's sort of okay. like land residual. And at the very end, there's a guy, there's a salmon in the river, and he's worth about eight cents. It's a tough business. Uh, let me turn to Julie and see if anybody has any questions for Dr. Kurlansky, because uh, you're a very uh, interesting and charming guy. I love the book. You didn't get to show the, the picture, salmon. Got to see salmon. Uh, I read it, as I said, cover to cover. And you actually, for a writer, you have a bit of humor. It's quite, it's quite pleasant. So Julie, do you have anybody who wants to ask the uh, good, uh, the salmon doctor a couple of questions? We do, and you're right, Neil. Um, Mark has the ability of taking all of these subjects and just bringing them, it's, you know, salt, a whole book on I mean, it's just amazing. Love all of your writing, Mark. Um, okay, so yes, we do have some comments and questions here. So the first one came from Julia. I had a, um, Neil had a comment, but we'll uh, get to his question in a minute too. So Julia would like to know, can you give a little history about Atlantic salmon in the Northeast rivers? Um, Northeast, North, North America, yeah, it's, it's where I'm from. Um, I actually grew up by the Connecticut River in Hartford. Um, Connecticut River was one of the greatest salmon rivers in North America. And when I was growing up, I didn't even know that. Nobody knew that. Salmon was so long gone from the Connecticut River that nobody even remembers that it used to be a salmon river. Most of the rivers in New England have been destroyed by this pattern of uh, damming and pollution. Um, uh, they have been having a little success with bringing back the Penobscot, the biggest river in Maine, um, uh, by tearing down some dams. <clears throat> um, there are still rivers in Canada, in the Maritimes and uh, Newfoundland, Newfoundland and Labrador, um, that have good salmon runs. Um, uh, but New England, uh, except for this struggling hope for the Penobscot is, is just completely finished. I mean, it's, it's really sad. New England used to be about salmon. Growing up in New England, I mean, I'm telling you, I didn't know the salmon had anything to do with, you know, I grew up eating fish. Fish was a big thing in New England. You had this huge variety of fish, but nobody ate salmon. Uh, nobody even knew about salmon. When John Adams was president, uh, he had the White House serve salmon because that's what he was used to eating. Love it. Okay, so uh, sorry, Nathan, I called you um, Neil earlier. Nathan, Nathan had a couple of comments. So his first comment, when you first started talking, he said he didn't know, he was basically, he's a fly fisherman based in Michigan, and he didn't know that they always go into the same river when they come out of the Great Lakes. So he thought that was very interesting. But his question is, let me get back down to his question. So he says, salmon seem like very adaptable animals. For example, salmon have adapted from salt water to the fresh water of the Great Lakes. Is there any hope that they could eventually adapt to warmer waters due to climate change? Um, it's a good question, one that I get all the time and really wish I had an answer for. Um, <laughs> We, I, the answer is we, we don't really know. Uh, so far, not. Uh, so, so far, what we're seeing is waters warming with great consequences. I mean, uh, bad things happening in Alaska because the water is warmer. Um, uh, we don't see any sign of, of their adopting, but you're right, they are tremendously adaptable. Um, the Great Lakes, uh, I, I should say, uh, I don't know much about. 
uh, they are a completely unnatural situation. And so <clears throat> their life cycles and what that's all about and how they adopted is something that I, I, I haven't really um, looked into. But, but you're right that, you know, they have, I mean, salmon are not a Southern Hemisphere fish and they have them now in uh, New Zealand and Australia and South Africa and Chile and Argentina. Um, so who knows what the possibilities are, but so far there's no sign of their dealing with climate change. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's gonna be devastating. Oh, so Amanda has a question. This is kind of a little on and off topic here. She wonders if Mark's big orange cat is a salmon fan. <laughs> Zola. Okay, well, I have to tell you that Zola has died. Oh. Yeah, he was very oh. old. He was he was 20 years old. <gasps> um, wow. And he and actually he was a salmon fan. He he ate he ate salmon. Um wow. he ate everything. <laughs> <laughs> Let's say you're 20 and as a cat, you get to do that, right? <laughs> and he really did sit on my lap like that all the time when I was writing. Yeah, there must be pictures out there. So that's uh, that, that must be uh, um, what she's referring to. Um, okay, so Clark has kind of a long one here. So first he wants to say thanks for giving this talk. He spent a summer um, involved with salmon fisheries in Sitka, Alaska, and actually tried my hand at salmon trolling. He is looking forward to reading the book. How did you find the research process with engaging with fishermen and others involved with salmon? And then also in regard to salmon hatcheries, he's interested in what you think on the sustainability of produced fishing for commercial fishermen to catch and improve stocks at these hatcheries. I think you covered it a little bit in the talk, but. Okay, let me try to remember all of that. <laughs> yeah, the first part was, um, how did you find the research process with engaging oh, with fishermen and others involved with salmon? I, tell you, I have a fishing background. When I was a kid in New England, I worked on commercial fishing boats and I have a great affection for commercial fishing and, and, and commercial fishermen. And um, I'm oddly fond of the whole thing. I, I talked my way onto a gill netter in Alaska and uh, fished in the Gulf of Alaska and uh, didn't want to take me because I said that, you know, people, they, would, they think it's a great idea and they go out and they get sick and then she stuck with them and stuff. I said, listen, I grew up fishing in the North Atlantic. She said, okay, you can come. And later she said that she loved having me because she'd never seen anybody seem so happy on a commercial fishing boat. <laughs> you, I just, I just love it. You know? And uh, fishermen appreciate that. They're right. doing their living. They're not as happy as I am. <laughs> <laughs> So, I mean, that's the easiest part of the research for me. Yeah. Um, in, in fairness to that question, you do get to come back to New York. You don't have to be cold and wet for the entire year. I don't, but uh, I might not mind it. Right. <laughs> and then he was also asking about the sustainability of producing fish for commercial fishermen to catch and improve stocks in the hatcheries. Yeah. Um, I, I kind of doubt it because... Um, as I was saying, hatcheries have not worked out well. They just, they, they don't work out well. And there is some indication that they, they, they weaken the wild stock when they mix with them because a hatchery fish is really not quite up to the standards of a wild fish. And so if you have a, a successful fishery, don't add hatchery fish. Um, they're doing that in Alaska, and it, it disturbs me. Uh, they don't need to add. They have a good fishery. They don't need more. The truth is that the reason they're, they're doing more is not for the commercial fishery, but for the uh, uh, fly fishermen. Sports is a big industry in Alaska, and they're trying to provide more fish for sportsmen. But Ooh. it's not a good idea. I, I think that you cannot rule out hatcheries um in places where it's desperately needed such as restoring rivers uh that uh, had almost no fish in them you could use hatcheries to help bring them back in, in desperate situations but if you have a successful fishery don't try to buck bulk it up with, with hatchery fish it's a mistake Interesting. okay and then dustin would like to know perhaps mark could explain what pebble mine means for the future of bristol bay salmon um, 
Well, if the pebble mine were to happen, by the way, I'm somewhat confident it won't. Mm -hmm. um, Army Corps of Engineers turned them down on the Clean Water Act. And now guess, guess what happens on January 20th? We get the EPA back. We get an actual environmental protection agency. Um, Thank God. Yes. And, and they opposed, they, they blocked uh, Pebble Mine. And I think they would, they, they would block it again. If Pebble Mine were, were built, it might be fine for a while, but it's a matter of time till it had an accident. And that accident would devastate the largest salmon run in the world. Right. It's insane. Yeah, crazy, crazy things. Well, that's our cop. But I, I have to ask since we, we, we started off talking when we digressed into the Basque history of the world with uh, earlier. I, I have to ask the personal question: What made you pick that as a topic? Because all of your other topics are, you know, cod. They're very singular topics. What was it about the Basque history of the world singular that drew you to? <laughs> so what? The singular people. Uh, <laughs> I, um, well, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a long history. Uh, I, as a young journalist, had this great idea that I was going to report on Franco mm. in Spain because nobody was reporting on him. And I thought, this is incredible. The last fascist dictator still in power. You know, this I, thought, I thought Franco was, st he's still alive. <laughs> no, that's salmon. <laughs> Um, and, you know, I went to Spain and I realized people were reporting on it because there wasn't much of a story. And then the Basque, Eta actually, um, uh, blew up Carrera Blanca, Franco's uh, uh, chosen successor. And so I thought, oh, well, things are happening in Basque country. So I went up there. And I mean, you know, it's one of the most beautiful places in the world. It has this incredibly rich culture, which, you know, by all logic should have been long gone, but it's mm -hmm. not, it's preserved. Mm -hmm. um, this, this crazy language that crazy. Uh, people, people still speak, that kids speak in school now. Um, you know, it, it, when, uh, when I was first there in Franco times, I wondered what Basque sounded like because you weren't allowed to, to speak it. And right. I, never, I never heard it. Now I hear it all the time. I hear kids speaking it. I um, and the dialect. It's not like if people think that oh, it's part of Spain, and it's like no, it's a whole different di. Everything about it is completely uh, different. It, it, it's not Latin. I mean, no. Uh, I mean, what do you say about a, a language where S is no and S goes yes? I mean, it's, it's crazy. That's interesting, but thank, thank you for answering that because it was just like, it was a, that particular book holds a, a very big place in my heart. So thank you for answering that. Let's see, do we have something else that somebody's brought in? People are just putting in some um, comments there. Uh, and so yeah, we'll look at those comments in a little bit. Um, currently there are there any organizations? Okay, um, Julia wants to know, are there any organizations that promote salmon sustainability that I can be a part of in the New York City area? Oh, in the New York City area. Um, I'm not sure, certainly in the Northeast, there's the, there's the, uh, the, the, the salmon, uh, the, the, the salmon fund and the, the several salmon organizations in the Northeast. Um, which work on salmon in New England and, and Canada and uh, um, issues of salmon farming. And uh, um, I'm not sure how active they are in, in, in New York <laughs> City because there's nothing going on in New York City. Yeah. Not going on. Nothing with salmon is going on in New York yeah. City. Actually, nothing is going on in New York City. In New York City right now, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so maybe just look at it and support some things that are happening up in the Northeast. So Mark, what are you working on next? Got something else coming for us? Uh, many things. I have a book coming out in April. Okay. Uh, um, it is um, is about fly fishing, and um, it's uh, it's about why people fly fish, why I fly fish, and the history of fly fishing. It's called the unreasonable virtue of fly fishing. Because, you know, if you think about it, fly fishing is a ridiculous thing to do. 
it's not it's not a good way to catch a fish <laughs> you know often when i'm in places like alaska or the kamchatka in russia and there's a lot of bears around and the bears they they, they kind of sit there and they watch you while you're fishing and it looks to me like they're thinking what the hell is he doing this the why is he doing it that way <laughs> I mean, this is here's a guy who sticks his mouth in the river and grabs one. You know? <laughs> um, so you know, wh wh why do why do it? Why do I do it? Why why does uh, why does Neil do it? Why uh, um, why have people done it? Going back to ancient times, and uh, how has it changed? Uh, uh, what are flies about? When did reels come along? The changes in rods, uh, the the literature oh, of fly fishing. Speaking of flies, have you read the Feather King or the the, See, the Feather King? King? Yes. Yeah, I I was given that. I read it. For those who don't know, it's all about how a salmon fly could be worth a thousand dollars. Well, the thing, the thing that interests me about that book is about a guy who uh, breaks into a British museum. And he steals these really valuable historic, um, uh, not flies, feathers, you know, from Darwin exhibitions and all these, these feathers. And he makes flies out of them that, that, that he sells. But here's the part that I find really interesting. When they caught him and they interrogated him, he started talking about flies and explaining about these feathers and about the flies. And they decided he was crazy. And he beat the rap. He beat the rap because he thought he wasn't right in the head. <laughs> and he just, he sounded like a fly fisherman, you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, I can't wait for that one. I have a couple friends who are fly fishers that love to fly fish. So uh, I will be buying that as a gift for them for sure. Um, well, that's about what we have for time. I want to thank um, Patagonia and Carla for putting this together for us. Um, always, always love hosting you, Mark. Um, you have a website that people can find you at? Is it just markkurlansky.com? Is that? Markkurlansky.com. Okay, perfect. And Neil, for you, how should people find you if they would, if they so would like to? Do you have a website or anything? I do. Ed. Well, yeah. So the website, I'll give you a website. It's um, called <laughs> I'm there for you, baby dot com. No apostrophe. I'm there for you, baby dot com. No space, just I am there for you, baby dot com. I have. Um, I, I'm not as prolific in terms of being able to write a book as uh, Mark, but if you go there, there's 280 or 90 columns. I've been writing this column for the San Diego Union Tribune for seven, six, I guess seven years, and I average about 45 a year. And you can just wander through and be bored to tears. Love it. Well, people have lots of time right now, so they'll find something new to, new to read. So Mark, when it comes out in April, I'm not sure if we're going to be in a different world, but maybe you'll come back virtually with us. I, I, I will, or, you know, maybe in person. Yep. So uh, hopefully, I, I'm not sure who we're going to be. Yeah, April's going to be one of those weird times. I, I glad, I'd be glad to come back virtually. Can I tell my, my San Diego Union story? Um, yes. So I used to write this uh, uh, column in their op-ed page. Uh, I was the token lefty. Uh, they felt like they should hear from one weird guy. <laughs> uh, and I, I wrote this article. I was, I was uh, living in Mexico at the time. And, I, and I, I wrote an article about the drug issues in Mexico. And it was really about uh, how the Reagan administration was unfairly leaning on Mexico. It was quite sympathetic to Mexico. But the union illustrated it with a takeoff on the Mexican seal, the eagle landing on the cactus, and he was smoking a joint. And the Mexicans were so insulted by this that they burned the union. They, they, they got copies of the union and burned it on the streets in Tijuana. <laughs> oh my, were you, did they do it? Did they know that you wrote it? <laughs> they did, but I was, I was in Mexico City and <laughs> <took it away. laughs> Okay. You'll throw it up away. <laughs> well, lots of San Diego centric things here. Mark, we always enjoy hosting you. And so hopefully we'll see you um, next year against one way or another for the new book. And Neil, thank you for um, the great conversation. 
He's a pleasure. He's a fascinating guy. I've talked to him a few times and I'm waiting for the fly fishing book also. So okay. nice, nice talking to you. Excellent. Thank All right. Bye. I will take us off of Facebook. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night.